What does it take to grow a business from side hustle to a multi-generational enterprise and legacy? So in one sense, you want to build a company that's going to do 15 or 15 and a half million next year. Yeah. But also somebody's got to be thinking about what 25 million looks like. Writing a business plan profoundly changed the way I achieve things because you have to plan for growth. In this founder interview, we'll hear from founder and author Kevin Nolan on what it takes to build organizational muscle. Kevin will share the story and secret on what it took to become the largest private residential painting company in the country. An entrepreneur has to be ready and willing and able to solve problems and do it quickly. And when they make a mistake, I think it's good if an entrepreneur can own up and say they made a mistake. Have values, have a culture. Because when you have employee-based company, it's important that you have those things. Be sure to listen to the end to hear how to prepare the next generation to lead to another level of transformation and entrepreneurial growth. Greetings, Doc John, Entreprofessor here. I'm really excited to have a special guest. Uh, oftentimes, you'll hear on my channel from startup kind of entrepreneurs in the launch process are starting to grow. Um, today, I have a special guest who is a thriving entrepreneur who can really look back and tell us the whole story. So Kevin Nolan of Nolan Painting is here. Thanks so much for being here, Kevin. Thanks, Doc John. I really appreciate the opportunity to tell a little bit about my story. Awesome. Well, and I think I have to add, I mean, I, that wasn't even a complete list. I have to add now like uh, organizational consultant, successful author, probably soon to be award-winning author, I, I suspect. And <laughs> so uh, a lot invested in this organizational muscle. We will uh, we'll definitely be talking about that as we go here. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, so why don't you start out? I, I, I actually think most of my audience in the kind of mid-Atlantic seaboard region probably know who you are, but well, fill in a little bit about what is Nolan Painting, who, who you are, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into something. Yeah, I, I don't know about mid-Atlantic region, but certainly in the, in the paint industry, maybe. And then locally, in a couple of square miles, I might be a local celebrity, but it's a big world. And I go outside of that world and people go, Kevin who? Uh, so I know what that means, but um, so yeah, I started a painting business about 43 years ago, uh, and I've been plugging away at it for years and years and years, a house painting business. And um, about 15 to 20 years ago, I started a consulting business as well called Nolan Consulting Group. So Nolan Paintings is my main company. Nolan Consulting Group is my sister company, which I run with my brother. Um, but um, basically over the years, I've built... Um, if not the largest, one of the largest residential painting companies in the United States, um, employee based. That's sort of what I, that's my stock and trade. We, we don't use subcontractors. We, you know, we're building an employee based company and therefore I get to do all the cool things that I get to do in organizational muscle, which is like, you know, have values, um, have a culture. Cause when you have employees an employee based company, it's important that you have those things and, and lots more as well. Um, but um, yeah, it's been 43 years. Um, and like most businesses, uh, started out really hard. And um, like hopefully a lot of businesses, we're a lot better at it now and things are going a lot better. Um, minus recessions and pandemics, things are going pretty well. Nice. And and from what I recall, it, it all started with trading painting services for rent or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah I had done some painting. Uh, actually, I was painting for somebody during the summer of my, I guess it was my, uh, between my sophomore and junior year at Villanova. And I was painting for $2.35 an hour. And then um, I guess I went had one of my first entrepreneurial seizures. I thought, why don't I find a house to paint? And then I'll I'll, I'll paint the house in exchange for rent. So I found a professor at Villanova, Dr. Harrington, who had a big mansion in Wayne that was bigger than he could afford to have painted. Turns out it was bigger than I could actually physically paint. Um, <laughs> but I worked on it for a long time um, with a roommate. My roommate quit on me. He was like, this is nonsense. I, I don't need to, I don't want to rent an apartment that bad or whatever. So I, 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 I mostly finished it. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't tell this in the book, but I actually went back about two years later after I graduated and actually had a painting business. And I, I put in a couple more uh, days with the crew and, and did finish. Um, oh, nice. I'm a stickler about finishing things. So it bothered me more than it bothered Dr. Harrington. But um, it was a lesson about biting off more than you could chew. Yeah. Um, and yet I've continued to do that. 
but you you do get to, when you get when you do get a little bit of punishment around it, it does make hope you know hopefully make you make better decisions and yeah. um, so yeah, so now that house would cost a hundred thousand dollars to paint or something like that. It was just humongous. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I actually think that's a great part of the story. And, uh, you know, I, I, this is the first time I'm hearing of it, just of, of actually going back and finishing it, even, you know, even like later, that's, uh, yeah. well, and I think- that, You know, that, it was a splinter in my hand. I, it was it was basically a pebble in my shoe. And I, I just couldn't live with the fact that I hadn't delivered on my promise. And yeah. um, like I said, he was pretty happy. He got, he knew he had gotten a good deal, you know? <laughs> For a few months, for a little bit of rent, he had gotten most of his mansion painted and he was yeah. letting me off the hook. But yeah, I wasn't letting myself off. Yeah, that's great. Well, I mean, I think that that points to and I you see a number of examples of this through the book. Like you talk about values and the culture and the importance of values. And I think about even just your own, like, you know, some of the things along the way that formed your kind of ethical approach and you know, the values. You know, I think about like the, the broken window and the 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 uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, the the um, the bird that that uh, that took yeah. the rap for it, you know, and just but just I I think that that's a really interesting yeah one of the first houses we were painting we you know we we cracked um, a like a storm glass picture window I'm guessing it would have gone for a couple hundred dollars I don't know but that was more money than we had or even were getting for the paint job um, and so we we came up with this idea it was probably my idea of finding a dead bird so you know rather than work on the house. We went around the neighborhood. We found a dead bird. We've got some red paint. We put some red paint. We framed the bird. The bird's laying there. We tell the customer, come out, look what just happened. Um, they buy the whole thing and we walk off scot-free. But as I mentioned in the book, yeah, that's haunted me. Yeah. That's haunted me my whole life. Um, since that time, I've broken hundreds of windows and grandfather clocks and pianos and floors and everything and um yeah I mostly forget about them because we we did right you know we did the right thing we we replaced it we repaired it we reimbursed the people for it and no longer part of my conscience anymore easy, <laughs> right. to, easy to forget so, yeah yeah that's right what they say in entrepreneurship yeah the, i guess the mark zuckerberg comment about move fast and break things in your business that means something totally different but <laughs> yeah yeah his business is nothing like ours believe me right yeah, <laughs> that's great. Well, good. Well, um, so just talk a little bit about your ideal customer. You know, just who are they? What's the real value that Nolan Painting provides that or what do they crave that only Nolan Painting can, can provide? Well, you know, that's that's such a great, great question. And, and I remember being in business a long time before I defined it. So meaning I was just taking all comers. Right. I would take any job I could get. And if things got lean, you know, I might I might do landscaping for them if they wanted, whatever. I, you know, if things got lean, we would get we would do whatever we took, and um, we would work for builders, and we would work in new construction sites. And so over the years, I decided I can't make money doing this. I can't make money doing that. I know what it's what we can make money at. And when I say make money, money is not the most important thing in the world to me, but it's super important because without it, you can't live, right? So you have to make sure you make arrangements to be a profitable company or you're not going to be able to to sustain. Um, so at some point along the way, we decided um, residential was our business um, and we don't do new construction. We don't paint new drywall. We don't work for general contractors. We don't do third parties. We don't do apartment complexes. So that's a lot of no's, right? Well, what is the yes? The yes is um, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, we don't really like to work for super rich people either um, um, because they could be really demanding. Um, we decided, you know what, what we want to do is we want to we want to come up with what our offering is, what we can do and what we think we can do better than anybody and only take customers who appreciate what that is. Nice. And that sounds kind of obtuse, but the reality of it is, is it's once again, it's not the extremely rich person because that's not really scalable for me. Um, I need lots of rich people and they keep demanding more than I have, or maybe they want to see me, or maybe they want to see, you know, they're demanding, they want more people there. They want, so what we do is we work for, um, you know, middle, middle class, upper middle class people that um, value a really good job that want someone's going to show up on time, handle all the details, leave a really neat, clean job, stand behind the work, 
um, and just run a really fine project, which, by the way, is our promise. All those, all those things I just said to you are on my website. They're on the back of my business card. They're, they're, we talk about them all the time. What is our promise to the customer? The promise to the customer is that we're going to do all those things. Yeah. Um, and we're going to, you know, we're going to deliver 100% of the time. And we even go so far as to say, if we don't, you don't pay. Um, yeah. And that really makes us fine tune about what we are. Um, I think I, I tell the story in the book about how one customer was all hyped up about quality and craftsmanship, which are important. I mean, I'm not going to deny that that's a really important angle. We have to be able to produce high quality um, and really good craftsmanship. Um, but really, it's not the most important thing to us. Um, the most important thing to us is that we do that in a friendly way with really nice people working for really nice people. Yeah. Um, and that, that may sound, once again, kind of out there obtuse, but um, I know it when I don't see it. I yeah. know it when somebody is mean to my employees or, or rude or anything. I hate to say it, but I'm stuck up. We're not working for you. Yeah. Right? And I think well, you, talked about, you kind of have a process for firing a customer, as I recall. Right? We do. We do. We uh, we would satisfy a customer with a smile and a grin and we would make sure they were 100 percent satisfied. And if they proved to be overly difficult to achieve that result or um, or like in the case of this example, this this customer who did not like her shutters. When I said to her, I said, well, the important thing is that my people were friendly. Right. And she said, no, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that, that you do high quality craftsmanship on these historical shutters. And, you know, since I'm in business 40 years, I probably said what I shouldn't have said, which is, oh, you chose the wrong contractor. For us, friendly is more important than craftsmanship. Yeah. And she looked at me like I had three eyes. Um, but I did repaint her shutters again because I'm friendly. That's what she wanted. Um, but guess what? We don't want to work for that customer again. So we put a little star next to their name. And if they if she calls again, which, by the way, she has, because um, they usually when someone who is particularly demanding and difficult gets satisfied, they often go back to the source of their satisfaction, meaning right. me, the customer, me, me, the client. I'm sorry, the contractor. So they uh, they want me to do the job again and we don't want to work for them. And we just say in a friendly way, sorry, we're going to pass on this opportunity. Um we may elaborate a little bit more and say it didn't go so well for us, but we won't say any more than that yeah. because we're not looking to alienate anybody. We're just looking to choose, just choose our clients so that we have as much control as possible over the situation. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah. So I've heard you say it once uh, today and I've, I've heard you say it in the past. You've talked about your entrepreneurial seizure. Yeah. Uh, Tell us a little bit more about that and what, uh, what, what happens next. Yeah, so I guess when I was having my $2.35 an hour episode, I was having an entrepreneurial seizure. I was The whole time I was thinking, I'm getting paid too little. I could do better. I don't have the right tool to do the job. You know, no one's helping me here. You know, I was frustrated and decided that, yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing this on my own next time. And I can make more money and do a better job and, and be more satisfied. And, you know, to me, that was the entrepreneurial seizure. It was to say, um, yeah, I'm willing to go out on my own and I'd rather, I'd rather, you know, risk or chance fate or chance my own fate than, than what I'm currently being delivered. I don't really like it, so I'm going to move on. And so, you know, I had that entrepreneurial seizure. I got out of college and I continued to paint houses and um, pretty good in the beginning. Um, virtually no government regulation. A lot of cash business. Uh, I think the statute of limitations are long since over. I can't get in trouble for saying that uh, 40 years ago. But, you know, it was pretty easy in the beginning. And uh, then I, I wanted to get legitimate. I remember my dad, he was an attorney and he was like, if you're going to do it, son, you know, we just got through Villanova. You got to be good at it. You got to do it right. And so then we, you know, we started getting legitimate and having the proper insurance and paying the proper taxes and, you know, all of a sudden you're getting targeted by some government agencies now and then. And, and um, frankly, it got really hard. And for a lot of years, I struggled 
saying like, why did I do this? This isn't working out for me. I started having kids. Um, it started getting harder and harder. And I hate to say it, but I, I found myself 17 years doing the same thing every year and just kind of complaining about it and not really. And then, um, you know, like we've talked before, I read the book, um, the, the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. And what was like, it's like I got hit in the head with a hammer. Um, I had yet another entrepreneurial seizure that day in 1997. And I'm, I'm happy to say I've never been the same since. I've had plenty of tough times but I've, since then, but I've never felt the same way about those tough times. I've always felt more empowered and enabled to be able to solve my own problems. And, and, and I think to me, an entrepreneur has to be ready and willing and able to solve problems uh, that they see in the world, in humanity, in their community. And they have to be able to do it and they have to be able to stay ahead of the game and do it quickly. And when they make a mistake, they have to be able to change quickly. I think it's good if an entrepreneur can own up and say they made a mistake, happens to be one of my strong suits. Um, I apologize for making mistakes all the time. I can make a mistake, apologize for it and move on. Um, and um, so now we are actually an entrepreneurial company, which means we are always trying to improve. Um, we, uh, we get worried about what's happening on in our industry. So we are a um, about 130 person residential painting company. I mentioned to you, they're all employees. Um, and the industry wants to disrupt us like all businesses. I mean, the world is trying to disrupt you, whether it's whether it's Angie's List or Google trying to decide when I get a phone call, like how a customer finds us, um, or whether it's uh, the onslaught of um, some new franchises that are out there trying to do what we do, um, who hire a lot of subcontractors. We see all this as potentially disruptive. Yeah. So we want to be disruptors. We want to be the one disrupting. Um, yeah. And when I, about a week ago, I got a, a, um, a podcast from somebody who is coming into my territory. Um, they are targeting us. They bought, I guess, six franchises, which would cover my territory. And they're, they're targeting Nolan Painting as the company to go after. Uh, and it, it was funny because I sent it to my team. I sent it to my kids, one group text, and I sent the podcast to my management team, another group text, and a couple of folks. And it was just, it was really good to see them get all riled up. Um, go, let them see them try, or they don't know how hard it is, or he makes it sound easy, boy, is he in for it. Um, but I, I wanted them to realize that there's people out there coming for us. Yeah, yeah. And, you need to be entrepreneurial to survive. I mean, you had to be entrepreneurial to get through COVID for crying out loud, you know, yeah. and all the things that happened through that. So yeah, oh, I, I one of the one of the first uh, blog posts I did during COVID was I, I called it COVID nineteen pivot or persevere because it just felt like one of those moments where it's usually competition creating that moment where you really got to decide it's time to adapt or or or, or shift yeah. directions. And this was like something that was like a greater force on everyone. And some, well, I mean, at one point it was a government competing because yeah. they were paying people $1,150 in my state in Pennsylvania to not work. That was the unemployment. And I think it went on for nine months or something like that, that yeah. you could collect. And it's, you know, there was a, there was the great resignation, which really was the great inability to hire people for, for the nine months that followed COVID. Yeah. Because these service jobs, they're not the most friendly jobs in the world, whether it's working at a restaurant or whether it's digging a hole or painting a house. They're not the easiest jobs and they weren't super desirable. And if you can make more money on unemployment, maybe doing a side hustle as well, it was yeah. impossible to hire people. So just one of the myriad of challenges that we've had to go through over the last few years. Um, I would say overall, looking back, though, I hate to say this, it's crazy. It's probably a net positive all said and done. I mean, we're more profitable now. We have more money in the bank and we're in a different position than we were then. So yeah, uh, go figure. Well, there could be a lot of opportunity and just having being forced to look at the world through a different lens for, you know, for a time. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That. Yeah. I, you're uh, it's funny talking about competition. Uh, made me think of the story you told in the book of uh, the hand painted sign that disappeared and, then yeah. discovering it. <laughs> it's, in my, it's in my hallway. Um, 
So I think, you know, we've been a bit of a target since the get go because yeah. people have always said, you know, how, well, first off, I, I market pretty aggressively and, uh, you know, that meant always putting a sign out in front of someone's house and having your trucks lettered and things like that. And early on, I just realized that you had to do those things if you wanted to, 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 to grow, you know, that was entrepreneurial. It's come up with new ways of guerrilla marketing. And, and I, I tell the story about uh, painting the, uh, the late great Villanova coach, Roly Massimino, you know, he's a national, national champion coach, NCAA champ. Um, and we just, we paint his house right afterwards. And I had this back then they didn't have uh, silk screening or any other type of uh, printing. Everything was hand lettered. If you wanted a sign, you hired a sign painter and he free handed you a sign and he charged you a couple hundred bucks, which is a lot. I could get, I probably could get uh, 200 signs now for 200 bucks, but Back then, it was uh, it was uh, one sign, and I put it up in front of Roly's house, and the very next day, it's gone. And um, yeah, like ten years later, I'm at a competitor's house, uh, his office, and and I see it hanging on the wall. And uh, I thought we were friendly competitors, but not no more. Um, <laughs> so I ripped it off his wall, and I never talked to him again. But I can hold a grudge. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, so I think that's like perfect time to uh, to transition into grow. Like when was a, a period in time? When was a period in time when you just realized that what you've been doing to get off the ground needed to change and it was time to really think about how do we grow this? Yeah. So once again, that was it. 1997. And it was kind of like a lot of things happening. I think I was 37 years old. And, you know, I noticed a lot of entrepreneurs at that age start to make changes in their lives. And, and I was prepared to, I started to really surround myself with better people, better meaning better than me, um, you know, smarter people than me and be willing to admit that, be willing to admit that, that, you know, Steve is better at financials than me. John is better at sales and, and Colin is better at operations. And, you know, and by the way, one third of me and any one of those three things is going to be much, much less than any of them can produce. Yeah. Um, and so I started to realize that. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did back then, and, and Michael Gerber talks about it, he says, write it down. If you don't write it down, you don't own it. For some reason, that stuck with me because I was never a writer of anything. Um, but writing a business plan profoundly changed the way I achieved things. Um, stating that we were going to do this in the, follow in the next year and then getting a handful of people to agree and work towards that goal and then doing that, man, that is powerful. Like all of a sudden, like, you know, you're like the Phillies on the verge of winning the, the, the NLCS. Like you feel it. You just, it's like a momentum forms that is more or less unstoppable, even in recessions, even in COVID. It is unstoppable because you start to believe your own momentum and so next year you do again and next year you do it again. Well, I think when people start businesses, either they don't do a business plan, which, you know, that makes sense. You, you know, you're in, it's in your head. You just start a business and then writing it down just seems so mundane and so boring and so away from what it is you're trying to achieve. But then, but I always say now write a business plan and then rewrite it every year. I talk about that in my book. It is so important that you rewrite a plan every year. Because look how much the world has changed in my 43 years. One business plan would not have made it, you know. Um, even now, we're writing a new business plan that will take us into a new, a new, a whole new world. And we're, we've always sort of had this idea we wanted to double in size in five years. Um, you know, that's only happened a few times yeah. that you actually could take a five-year period and double in size. I mean, if if I would have, I would have been Facebook or Microsoft or something. Um, no, but we've, we've had a couple of double and fives. I mean, I think from, from 2001, not long after I had read the myth and started to implement some of these strategies to 2005. Yeah. We, 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 uh, we like uh, quadrupled in, in five years. So, um, it is not linear, but the, the point that, that I think you would make and I would make is you have to plan for growth. Yeah. For it to happen, because if it happens without planning, well, you're probably lucky, 
But Lord knows there's going to be some residual issues around that probably. Yeah. Like, you know, you're going to have problems that you didn't expect. You're going to have what they call growing pains, right? Right. You might have them anyway, but if you have, if you have some strategies thought out ahead of time. Um, so we grew 2001. We grew from 1 million to 2 million in one year. And then we grew to 3 million in the year 2003 and 4 million in the year 2004 and 5 million in the year 2005. And then we hit some walls. Yeah. Um, and that happens. I think it, we call them death valleys. Um, and um, yeah, I had it again, I think, in, when I was hit, when we were doing 10, 10 million. Um, and I feel, almost feel like we're struggling with that now, although the we've got some entrepreneurial solutions that we're pretty sure are going to kick in. Um, and we think we're going to be able to blow past it. But once again, it requires an entrepreneurial solution. It's not being done now. How are we going to do it? That's going to take a whole lot of effort to change uh, my thinking and then er the whole company's thinking um, to come along for the ride and to not, um, once again, like you said, not to bet the farm on something that maybe is so, so painful if you, if you fail. Yeah. Yeah. So in those couple of times when you had a really substantial growth, like what are some of the things that you did leading up to that to plan for it, prepare for it, or even facilitate it? Well, it's even this, back to the same thinking we're thinking about now. So for instance, um, a lot of times you have to build it before they will come. Um, so that means like, you, you need to build a sales department before you can start selling. Um, you need to build an inventory of, in my case, workers, of staff, before you can sell it. And often the way most business owners, and I have in the past, even in my entrepreneurial spurt in the last 20 years, are reacting. Mm -hmm. You know, not, 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 not so predictive, but reactive. Meaning um, we, we get busy and then we hire people. And then guess what? Everybody else in my industry is doing the exact same thing. And so now all of a sudden the labor pool is not so big. We can't hire people. Um, so one of the things that I remember doing was saying, let's take a chance that we're going to have a spring this year. Let's take a chance that like most every spring in our business, there's going to be a flurry of activity. Even though we only have a couple of weeks worth of work lined up or a week's worth of work lined up, Let's start hiring like we had a lot. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we we did that. And turns out I was right. You know, the, the spring did come. And we had hired all these folks. We were able to meet the demand. By the way, that's how we mostly grow, by growing people, by getting more people and, and, and employing more people, deploying them out to jobs. That's where the money comes from. It's not the sale of the paint job. It's the, the completion of the paint job that gets us the money. You know, the salesman thinks sometimes that when they sell a job, that <laughs> boom, they're done. But it's, it's really doing the job. Has to come in on time. Not a lot of problems. No broken windows. Things like that. Then you make the money on it. So my latest thinking is, God, I still have these same labor issues, by the way. Uh, my latest thinking is uh, build an HR department for a $25 million company. So um, we're going to do about 14 million this year. It's not about over 14, a little over 14 million. We got two months. We're on target. Um, we want to build. So in one sense, we want to build a company that's going to do 15 or 15 and a half million next year. Clearly we need to do that. Yeah. But also somebody has got to be thinking about, what 25 million looks like yeah. because, you know, corporate America gets in trouble all the time because uh, they think quarter to quarter and sometimes they don't do the right thing for their long-term prospects because they have to do the right thing for their short-term shareholders. Well, we're lucky. We don't have to do that. You know, you know, Amazon was, they knew they were going to be right. And he, he knew he was going to be right. Jeff Bezos. And so he figured, I'm just going to keep losing money, losing money. As long as I'm doing the right thing, I'll eventually work out. And for some reason, uh, corporate America bought his strategy. But that strategy is really not the strategy that made corporate America. You know, they need to see results. And But we don't. We 
So I'm building the company that is that is five years away. And we're going to build a big, robust HR department. So that's where that's some of my latest run around the hallway. Tell everybody what we're doing is uh, we got to build a bigger HR department. We have two people in HR for a 130 person company, probably too small, uh, but also can't seem to get to 150 because only got two people in HR. Right. Um, <laughs> Chicken and egg, right? Yeah. Chicken and egg. So we're going to build, um, we're looking to build the HR department up to five people and we're going to hire a couple more salespeople before we have all that demand in place. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and do that. That's entrepreneurial. It's a little scary. There is uncertainty. It'll be done with a plan. It'll be done with, you know, a thought process behind it, but it's still the idea is to um, build it and they will come as opposed to the lagging and dragging HR behind you only with all the problems that would then develop. And yeah. I talk a lot about HR problems in my book, as you know, yeah. Um, and um, so, uh, but sometimes it takes a long time to learn these lessons over and over again, different versions of the lesson, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I noticed as you were talking about growth, you talked to there were, uh, uh, maybe two categories. I noticed a lot was around the, the people side of it. So values and culture, but then I also saw a lot in terms of like, uh, you know, just structure and systems. I just be interested in your take on, you know, just, how some of those things come together, particularly in the growth mode. And I, I think you're already kind of moving in that direction. So yeah, there. well, I think um, entrepreneurs by their nature are a seat of the pants. So some of the stuff, like when I say write it down, they would bristle at that um, <laughs> because like they don't write stuff down. It's all in their heads. You know, they're, they're usually quick thinkers. They may not be deep thinkers, but they're quick. They could be deep too, but a lot of times they are moving so fast that writing something down or typing it out is just not, a good way for them to manifest their ideas. Um, and, and it really, it really is so important. Um, a lot of times they are seat of the pants, uh, but the people that they would surround themselves with um, aren't comfortable with that. Um, no one really wants to work for a seat of the pants owner or, or leader. They want somebody with some type of, I mean, they love the visionary and they love the fact that, that, you know, you will confront problems and act on ideas, but they, they, they're not as comfortable with change mm. as you and me would be maybe. Um, and, um, and yet the entrepreneur is really not comfortable with structure and like, we're going to have seven meetings a week. Yeah. Um, but I'm here to tell you, you need to have seven meetings a week or four or three or 12, or whatever your magic number is, uh, whatever you're working on, um, it turns out a well-run meeting is probably the most effective way to engage people. Now, I said well-run meeting. Yeah, right. Um, that's the unicorn, right? <laughs> that's the deal, yeah. Because, I mean, we all know what it's like to not um, be in a well-run meeting. And I think we've probably all been guilty of not running a well-run meeting. Yeah. So valuing what a well-run meeting is, I think if you spend time thinking about that and identifying it in your culture and you make that part of your culture, um, you know, they're not, they're not an hour if they could be done in 20 minutes and they're not even 20 minutes if they could be done in five. Cause we do these things called huddles every day on every job. And that's a meeting. And all I ask is five minutes to go over the safety issues yeah. and they, they do a report and they send it in every day and it's not negotiable. Like it's got to happen and they get bonus for it. Like it's so, you know, this carrot and stick going on, but you have to do it. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, like a meeting about uh, marketing, a meeting about HR, a meeting about finance, a meeting about operations. Frankly, without these well-run, very structured, on time, finish on time, every Tuesday, three o'clock, like all these, all these structure that could sometimes feel a little bit oppressive to the entrepreneur, actually create freedom. Yeah. Um, I mentioned that... Um, I can live with seven meetings a week. Believe me, I don't love it. But yeah, if you told me, okay, Kev, you have complete freedom, but seven times a week, you're going to have to get together and discuss these seven topics. And the rest of the time, you can go do whatever you want. Well, it's not quite like that, but there's some truth to that. And rather than talk about HR or an HR issue in the hallway, 
and have it intermingle with whatever I was I was doing. Yeah. Um, uh, we talk about it once a week. Once a week, we have a meeting about the rules of the game. Once a week, at three o'clock on Tuesdays, we talk about HR. It's an hour meeting. Sometimes it takes 45. It always ends in an hour, never over, because I have another meeting at four o'clock. Right. Um, and so we box these meetings together. We teach people how to have meetings. So when I'm not running the meeting, we teach people how to have the meeting. And I don't run a lot of them, but we use an agenda. We uh, sometimes I get told in these meetings, uh, Kevin, you're heading into the weeds um, or you're off on a tangent. I'm like, touche. You're absolutely right. We want this meeting to end on time. We have to stick to some structure. So, you know, that's one form of structure. And then all the other stuff that's important. I mean, you have to, I mentioned safety, like you have to have safety structure in a, in a residential painting company or you're going to have people getting hurt. Um, you know, you, you have to have meetings on marketing or you won't get customers. Mm -hmm. And um, in our case, we have to have a recruiting meeting once a week or we can't recruit people to our company. So uh, once a week, we talk about money. We have a financial meeting. It's only a 30 minute meeting. Go figure. Um, but boy, what a difference it makes to focus once a week on something and not be interrupted. Um, and most times if something comes in the middle of the week, if it can be saved to that meeting, we would save it to that meeting at three o'clock on Tuesday. If it has to be dealt with now, we'll make an exception to the rule. Yeah. And as I always say, we, if we make an exception to the rule, we want to watch out that we don't make the exception the rule. Yeah. So, uh, well, I would think in some ways it seems very freeing that you know exactly when there is a time to talk about something. And so you don't have to, you know, yeah. use a lot, you know, give it space at other times of the week unless it's critical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like Jocko Willing says, uh, it's discipline and discipline is remembering what you want. And so it's a discipline. But if I want to grow the company and I want to handle all these disciplines, HR, marketing, finance, I want to remember what I want. I want to hit a goal, I want to hit a target. Well, yeah. I'll do what it takes if I remember what I want, right? Like if I want to stay, if I want to stay a certain weight, and I want to gain a gain a lot of weight, and I remember that, well, maybe I only have a piece of chocolate cake tonight, you know, if I'm creeping over it, I'll say, Yeah, no, I'd rather I'd rather stay 175 pounds than eat that chocolate cake. And it helps. It just helps to remember what you want. And then, um, yeah, it's very freeing when you start to take make decisions in that way. I think it yeah. makes life a lot easier. Yeah. So. Yeah. And your, uh, your reference to the seven meetings, not not uh, an incidental. For those who haven't read the book, I mean, it's, there really are seven meetings and they're, they're very structured in terms of timing and purpose. Um, yeah, there's just, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. A one on Monday, one and three on Tuesdays, and four on Thursdays. Guess what? The rest of the time is unstructured, right? And valuable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. So, um, talk about just in the growth in that growth time. What are some of the the biggest hurdles that you ran into, and what were for you this? What was the secret to overcoming those? Well, I mentioned before, I think that um, a lot of times there's uncertainty. I think that the entrepreneur has these ideas and maybe would be hesitant because they don't always know it's the right idea. And I I mean, I, I, people think I'm so certain that I always know what I'm doing. Um, but that's not true at all. Uh, I'm willing to act on my certainties, no question about it. Um, but I do struggle with wondering how am I coming off? Is this the right way to be doing this? And so, um, and then of course, as you get older and have more success, you start to become more certain and more confident. And that, that has certainly become the case to the point now where like, I mean, for instance, training is a big deal in our company, training people. In fact, training people is in fact, um, it's our proprietary secret sauce, right? Like if, if painting a house is somewhat um, a commodity, let's say, we start with that. I want to get a house painted. You're thinking it's a commodity, paint a house. Um, the way we paint a house is what makes us special, right? So we focus on the way we paint a house. Everything from how we interact with the customer to the type of paint that we use. Everything, 100% of 
everything needs to be scripted and planned out. And like that sounds crazy, but it is not. It is how it is how it is done, right? Um, you have to plan out every aspect of the business that you can control and mitigate the ones that you can't control. And so uh, everything from customer service is all, you know, determined and ch- and improved and written and orchestrated and quantified. Um, I mean, I love the way uh, you talk about build, measure, and learn. I mean, we're building, measuring, and learning every day, right? We're, we're trying something new. We're seeing how it worked. And we're saying, what do we learn from it? I mean, that's it. That's the entrepreneurial journey. And I think if you stop doing that, I don't think you're an entrepreneurial company anymore. And someone could disrupt you. It could happen, you know. Yeah. And that's my fear um, as the entrepreneur, not becoming an entrepreneur anymore, like losing that ability. Um, so, yeah, so our training programs, I remember like being uh, at some point recently being maybe like a couple of years ago, being so certain that this is the way we have to do it, that um, we changed it all up. It was before COVID even. We changed it all up. So it was um, distance learning. Online learning platform, ours, we made it, ourselves, yeah. our content. We didn't take it from anybody. We didn't ask any other manufacturer or trade association to give us stuff. Um, I'm not saying we didn't read that stuff and become informed by it, but we made our own proprietary training program online, in the cloud, um, modules. We decided to copy what was happening in um, social media, which is short attention span, yeah, Short Michael. videos and clips. Yeah. Right? Love and that. younger people love it. They're used yeah. to it. Um, and so all of our all of our training is not done in our building. We have a great big building here. We have a great big conference room. We can fit a hundred people in it, but that's not the way we train because that's not the way people learn nowadays. Yeah. Uh, particularly not someone who I would hire to be a painter. They wouldn't learn how to be a painter in the classroom. They would learn how to be a painter in the field, right? Right. So we allow them to do the learning platform in the field. And then we copy a military um, learning format called OJT, on-the-job training. And we um, incentivize both the instructor and the the student um, to go through the modules and get trained and check check them off. Uh, Four stars is proficient. Uh, Five stars is Excel simple system everybody understands once you do that you move to the next one uh voila we've created a learning path um and a career path and a real job and a way to uh incentivize and promote and um, motivate people uh to move up um and it's really been our secret sauce absolutely yeah Yeah. that's excellent well it makes me think of like um you know organizations like McDonald's, you know, Ray Kroc was sort of known for, you know, it's like, we're going to make this so simple that a very common, you know, just doesn't have to be some specialized person with specialized training. It's, you know, the, the kind of a kind of common ordinary person will step in, follow yes. the system, learn the system, execute the system. And- everybody used to rebel against that because everybody wants to have great people. Um, I get it. Well, you can have great people in a great system, right? You can have great people in a system that that is so great and simple and the simpler it is, the better. And they will excel in that system and be happy in that system. Yeah. You know, I mean, but, but yeah, it has to be to the point where, I mean, in my world, I mean, I'm not hiring brain surgeons to paint houses. So in most cases, I'm hiring unskilled young people. So like McDonald's, it has to be, and by the way, I can't wait nine months to make a nickel off of them. I need to start making money off of them relatively quick, quickly. Yeah. Within a week or two, because just because of our model, we need to start making money off of them. Um, you know, as soon as we can get them physically capable of doing some tasks. Yeah. Um, so we've actually, I mean, a lot of times, you know, you look at companies like ours and we say, we're not really a painting company, we're a training company, or we're not really a painting company, we're a marketing company. I mean, it's good to have all those those things in your quiver, I think, to be able to do that. Yeah. So, yes. Well, and so you've talked a lot about like the kind of development of talent, training development. Um, but you also talk in the book a lot about 
uh, like employee, I'll call it employee engagement and motivation and some of the things there. And some of that is structural and some of it is cultural, but talk a little bit about that, that part of the process. Yeah, I think that is important. I mean, as part of the, the leader of the company, it's your job to have a vision. Um, and um, when I say that, um, I, I think of it as like, that's your main job. <laughs> like that's your job is to get this vision thing worked out. Like, don't be like waffling here. You have to get this vision thing worked out. I talk about doing it on paper, writing it down, um, sharing it, getting buy-in, making sure that it makes sense because you're uncertain. You want to get some other opinions and you get the buy-in, but then you have that buy-in and now all of a sudden you're a team going for that vision. So that's cool. So you get some there, but then, then the individual wants to have like they want to have, where where are they in that vision? Like, is there a future for them? Oh, it's great that you, you want to paint uh, $25 million worth of houses, but how does it help me? You know, um, incidentally, I often say, why shouldn't we grow? Um, people worry about companies growing too fast. Believe me, we have not grown too fast. It's taken 43 years. Um, <laughs> but um, it we should be the ones that grow because we're doing it right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, we have a tremendous net promoter score. We we're a best place to work every year. We treat our employees really, really well. We have a 401k and healthcare plan. We train people, they move up. We're the ones that should be successful, not the ones that are hiring subcontractors or not necessarily the ones that, that don't share with their people, the bounty of a successful business. So, so we should not feel guilty about, about it being a growing company. Um, and in that growth, we're going to create opportunity for folks to be leaders, uh, to move up, to take on new jobs. You know, someone could move up and become a salesperson. Someone could move up and become a manager. Um, or in um, some cases, I could create a picture for somebody of what life may look like for them in five years if they keep doing this, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I often get pretty specific. I, I get specific. I say things like, um, you, you could be making a hundred thousand dollars a year doing this or, um, yeah. Um, one of actually one of my crew leaders recently, um, was asking, he was, we were looking at trucks and he was asking for a, a Ford lightning, um, a Ford lightning truck is still about 80 grand. And, um, I don't have a Ford lightning and, I don't think we're buying him a Ford Lightning yet. Um, but I did tell him that if he moved up to the regional operations manager position, which could probably take three to five years, I'd get him a, I'd get him a Lightning. Um, so he was like, yeah, I, I, I think I could, I could wait for that. And so um, painting a picture, I think, for other people can be um, a superpower if you're prepared to help them get there and you know deliver on the promise and yeah. delivering on the promise means you have to be true to your word and all that stuff um but that's really what i live for you know one of my favorite quotes is you can get anything in the world that you want if you help someone else get what they want yeah and i've seen that work uh, yeah i think it's that, that like brian tracy or zig ziglar feels like i've heard yeah yeah like yeah, that. yeah and i've seen it work i mean I mean, I have this wonderful company where I, I have virtually no day-to-day -day problems. I mean, you know, most, if you were to talk to most contractors, um, probably a little smaller than me, but most contractors, you know, in an hour's time, their phone would go off like 30 times. Um, then my phone doesn't go off at all. Um, you know, I only deal with the essence of the worst problems. <laughs> I say all the smaller mom and pop problems that we would have every day. Um, are dealt with with other people in this organization. Yeah. And I'm just blessed that I've been able to, to get that kind of buy-in so that they would do that. But um, I will tell you that my five senior managers who have been with me for 25 plus years each um, will all be millionaires when they leave the company. Yeah. And um, I got whatever I wanted by helping get them what they want. You know, right. so very, very, very rewarding. That's awesome. Yeah. One other aspect of 
I'll call it thriving uh, that I, I saw you talk very openly about, which I, I think is probably very helpful because I'm sure some might keep the, a little closer to the vest. I mean, it seems like you've been able to over time kind of become your own bank, your own insurance company, even your own landlord. Yeah, um, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> talk a little bit about that. That's. Uh, really I, I mean, it was surprising. You know, I was writing this chapter on money. I have the money chapter and yeah, that's where I kind of laid out some of that stuff. And um, I'm not sure I planned on doing all that. But I was moving in that direction. Um, and uh, so the, once again, the concept is control the controllables, like control what you can control, um, you know, and know the difference between what you can and what you can't and so all that good stuff. But really, whatever you can control um, will just make you that much more likely to be successful in, in, in a business. And um, so, for instance, um, insurance, um, I, I came to realize a long time ago that if I didn't make claims, that my insurance would stay lower. Uh, mm -hmm. They use something called a mod rating, which is a rating of how many injuries you have versus how much your premium is. And your mod rating ultimately determines what um, insurance companies will charge you. And uh, so I, I determined that um, it was the right thing to do to handle my own problems whenever possible. So if somebody got hurt, I would say, you don't have to go on workers' comp. You know, we'll we'll file the claim, but we're not gonna we're not gonna submit your payroll. We're gonna pay you, mm -hmm. um, and we're gonna pay you until you're healthy. And uh, might sound like you're throwing money away, um, but but let me just tell you, if you pay the if you pay insurance premiums, um, they're gonna figure everything that they paid in a mm -hmm. given year, and they're going to charge you in the next couple of years. Because insurance companies are not in the business of taking losses yeah. and keeping those losses on the books. They make them back up again on you or the next person who's in that, who has that rating based upon the experience rating. So at any rate, um, yeah, so sure enough, my insurance stayed low. Um, and I'm in a business where most my competitors don't really have insurance or at least the proper amount. Meaning if you have a subcontractor, you don't have um, workers' compensation which is huge. It's expensive as all get out. Um, I can actually um, compete with companies that don't have insurance because mine has been able to stay so low. So along the way, we kind of found what's called an insurance captive, which mm -hmm. is um, an organization that gets a lot of like-minded businesses, like the mind I just told you, handle your own problems, take yeah. care of your people, um, even fix your own dents in your vehicle. It really has to do with our accountability value. Like we handle our own problems and only use insurance for catastrophes. Yeah. So my current plan is self-insured um, and we have a hundred thousand dollar deductible. And then we chip into another thing that covers up to 350,000 and then over $350,000. It's a company like Lloyd's of London uh, yeah. or something like that. It's actually, it's actually Zurich, but they, they would pay the high, high stuff. Well, it turns out the high, high stuff doesn't cost that much. It's yeah. the it's the zero to $100,000 exposure that's really costing the most amount of money. Um, yeah. But by controlling our own, our own destiny there, we naturally manage our costs better than the insurance company will. Because I get that employee back to work pronto. And I get them back to work not by threatening, but by, I mean, for lack of a better word, loving. Like I, I treat them like my son or my daughter. If someone gets hurt in my company, and we've had it, I mean, I've had some pretty bad injuries. I talk about some of them, but I've been in business a lot of years. I've had some bad injuries. And uh, when someone gets injured, um, we treat them like, like someone in our family, which means, you know, we're sending, we're sending someone to pick them up and take them to the doctor's appointments, to the physical therapy appointments. We're dropping meals off at the house. We're checking in on a, on a daily every other day basis. Um, we're bringing it back to work to do meaningful light duty work. Not, not, a, not in, in humiliating light duty work, yeah. but meaningful work. Um, you know, if you're, someone breaks their leg, um, you know, we'll, we'll have them do, we, we do, we, we paint kitchen cabinets and we have them sit on a stool and sand and clean kitchen cabinets um, for a few hours a day. Not, not, not so much so that they're going to become bitter about it, but 
that they are helping, that they are contributing, that they are a valued member of the of the company. And we yeah. treat them like that. And guess what? They want to come back to work and be and be healthy and be back to work as fast as possible. And so, uh, yeah, so it turns out um, it's very cost effective. Um, as far as being my own bank, uh, I want to get out of the business someday, uh, someday soon. And I don't want to be co-signing stuff. Um, yeah. I'm going to be uh, passing the business on to my uh, children. Um, in between, I have a transition period where my current management team will manage the company. They'll run the company. Um, so I'll still be the owner for a number of years while they manage the company. And when we go to borrow money for a vehicle or something, I don't want to have to be the one co-signing. Like, I want to be done with that. So as it turns out, we're, our debt's down to zero, and we have a chunk of money we set aside. And using discipline, we borrow money uh, for a vehicle from that. We do the same thing. We usually put down about 10 or 20% of the vehicle down, cost of the vehicle down from our cash flow. And then the 70 to 80% of the cost of the vehicle or whatever it is, would come from this uh, account, this we call it a capital investment account. And then we would, we, we amortize a statement yeah. and then we pay it back with interest. Now we're treating ourselves well, we're paying ourselves 4% interest right now, which is a very competitive rate, but that's good. Why not compete with your competitors with yeah. a good banker in your pocket? Um, so that turns out to have been a uh, smart thing to do either, as well. Once again, I just sort of, came upon that it made more and more sense the longer we were in business. And of course, buying the building that you uh, rent from uh, really is a no brainer if you can afford it. Uh, yeah. My building's paid off, uh, will be paid off, I'm sorry, it'll be paid off in a few months. Uh, coincidentally, on purpose, the same time that we uh, that I retire. And then um, the proceeds from that, from the rental, which is my Nolan painting paying me, uh, will be part of my income. Yeah. And uh, turns out it's probably one of the biggest assets I own. So, uh, go figure. I would have thought the business would have been the biggest asset, but it turns out it's the building. Um, so, yeah, really just all sound practices, I think, when you analyze them. Um, but it takes a while. Um, but the mindset is always good. And I love in uh, one of your videos, you talk about bootstrapping. Really, really important that new business owners understand bootstrapping yeah. because it's sometimes, maybe not now, but sometimes it is so easy to borrow money and that is dangerous Yeah, because um, you can get yourself in over your head with, I mean, the classic example is you borrow a lot of money and then next year you have to start paying it back and then you made profit the following year, but you don't know where the profit is. Yeah. You were using the profit to pay back the loans. Right. And most people thought, oh, I thought the loans were, were deductible. No, only the interest is deductible. And <laughs> only the the cost of the vehicle was deductible when you took it. And a lot of times your accountant says, take it in the first year now because you're not to accelerate. So it's paid off according to the, according to the, um, you know, on the, on the rolls, it's, it's been depreciated. Um, but you still owe payments for 60 months on this vehicle and you're going to have to pay them out of future profits. And you're wondering why you don't have any profits around. It's because you're, you're paying off loans. Um, and you can't cut loans, you know, in a downturn, I hate to say this, but in a downturn, you can cut a lot of expenses. You can even cut labor, but you cannot cut loans. Yeah. It's called going bankrupt when you can't afford them, you know? Yeah. So I'm always saying, borrow the least amount of money you can get away with and make sure you have enough to pay it back if you had to. Yeah. Uh, once again, that's learned, but wait, watch a video like yours and learn it the easy way. Read a book like mine and, and learn it the easy way versus the hard way, which is when, you know, when you're struggling. Yeah. And if you're an entrepreneur, I'm pretty sure somewhere along the way you're going to struggle. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, maybe one of the last things, just uh, I, you seem to have successfully 
brought your family into the business without breaking up the family. I feel like that might be a, a, a true accomplishment. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How is, is that? <laughs> Once again, wasn't entirely, I didn't plan some of that stuff. I must tell you, you know, I didn't write out in my, in my uh, vision or my primary aim that I wanted to have my kids in the business. Um, I just, I didn't, I wouldn't want to have guided them like that. I wanted them to make their own decisions in life. Um, and I think that somewhere along the way, they just thought cool business. We have a cool business, one that people are happy to work in one that does cool things in the community. I mean, you know, in our community, we're really involved in a lot of community activities and, and we just get to do cool things. And, you know, I think they thought that's probably the best job in the world that you can have is one where you can immediately engage and, and just experience that. So uh, one by one, my kids joined the business. Um, I will say that my two boys started the easy way, the way you would expect, you know, at age 15 or so, they, they started painting basement windows. And um, by the time they were getting out of college, the last year they were saying, this is the last year I'm doing this, Dad. Next year I'm getting a real job. Um, and then the following year, um, Nolan Painting looked pretty good to them. And they came and stayed. Um, and then I, I would say that I recruited my daughters uh, at some point. Uh, my one daughter I recruited um, from HR because I was having nothing but HR problems. Um, and then recently I recruited my other daughter in marketing. Uh, so she had some experience in marketing and now she's a marketing manager. So I've, they're in all four separate silos. One's in sales, one's in marketing, um, one's in uh, operations, running, running people in the field, and uh, one's in HR. So they touch but they and they cooperate and communicate, but they don't. They don't have, you know, any competing demands. Um, yeah. But what's more is we've role modeled uh, what getting along looks like. And I think that's so important. Um, not just getting along with each other, but getting along with coworkers, the way we solve problems. Um, and, um, you know, a couple other rules about separating family and business is important. I mean, you know, I hug my kids when I see them outside of work, I don't hug them in work. Um, that's not awkward. That's comfortable. That's, you know, that's comfort. And when we're outside of work, uh, we don't talk about work. Um, I think that's healthy. And um, when we're in work, we don't talk much about family. I think that's healthy. Um, but this whole, this whole thing about uh, respect, but also, God, do I feel lucky to have them? I mean, how lucky am I? I cannot, I pinch myself every day and go, how lucky am I to have this uh, well-behaved group of, well-behaved group of children that want to be together and that want to make our company great. Uh, it's way more than I could have asked for. Um, I can't help but think that, um, that I, myself, my wife, and my other leaders in the company role modeled what it, what it's supposed to look like. And that, that no matter what I said or did, it was the role modeling that mattered. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so if you were talking with an aspiring entrepreneur or someone who's thinking about it, or maybe they've experienced their first entrepreneurial seizure, what would be what would be some of the first advice you would give as they as they get started? Well, I said it before. It took me 17 years to figure it out, which is write it down. Um, write it down might sound overly mundane. Um, but I talk in my book about something called the primary aim. Michael Gerber talks about his version of it, but I have my version. Um, and so primary aim is what you want in life. You have to decide what it is that you, the entrepreneur really, really wants in life. It'd be as clear as you can about it. Cause then you'll know when you got there for starters, but also well, it seems like that can change from day to day, sickness and in health, seasonality, good times and bad, sounds like marriage vows, but it can change. Like what you want changes. And sometimes what you want is not what you think you want. So spending time deciding what you want. I'll give you a quick example. I wrote in my one of my primary aims that I, I wanted to open up another office in another location. And I chose Maryland. And so Maryland's about 110 miles away. And so sure enough, I opened up an office in Maryland 
And uh, then I, for about a year and a half, um, by, by the way, my accountant said, how much money are you prepared to lose before you pull the plug? I'm glad he said that because I included that in my primary aim. Yeah. I said 100,000, which seems kind of low, but um, sure enough, a year and a half into it, I'm 100,000 in the hole. And yeah, I'm not liking it. Um, mm -hmm. Turns out instead of being home for dinner at kids' soccer games, I'm driving back and forth to Maryland. Yeah. Like, that's not what I wanted. And I'm having leadership vacuums down there. And um, yeah, so I wrote a new primary aim and decided I didn't want that. Yeah. And I pulled the plug and then I opened up my uh, consulting company. And now I have a contractor in Maryland who pays us to consult with them. And they're running a painting business in Maryland and they're doing it, you know, kind of our way. Um, so that was another strategy to sort of spread. What I really wanted to do was I wanted to, to teach and spread and share the way, the way we do things. And yeah. Um, yeah, so writing it down. And then, the, so that's the first step. And then the second step is write it down again. All right, so the first one was write down what you want so that you know what you want. But then once you decide that, you have to decide what we want, meaning who's going to be in your business. And that's a that's a pretty it's a much more formal document. Uh, that's a business plan. And there's a certain piece in there called a vision. And that vision is written out. And um, we do a one and a three year vision and a 10 year vision. Um, and the 10 is kind of cloudy. The three is pretty real. I mean, we're shooting for the three. The one is happening. We're doing the one. Um, I bet you we do nine tenths of what we write down and plan on doing in the next year. Because, but I'll tell you, writing it down and then reading it in front of a lot of people at a company meeting, damn, we're doing that. <laughs> we're doing it. I don't, I don't say something and not do it. So it makes it real. And, you know, versus just running around spouting off ideas, not so real. Yeah. Written down. Distributed and shared, very real. Um, and when you do that a few years in a row and you start to do nine tenths of what you said you were going to do most years, people get a lot of confidence in your ability to lead. Yeah. And they go, wow, that's powerful. This He's a good leader. He takes us places where we need to go. Um, and I say that none of it's me. It's, it's a we. It's a team. The vision is a we. The primary aim is a me, but the vision is a we. And the primary aim is personal. I share it with some people, but not a lot of people. But the, um, the vision and the business plan is how we're going to get there. And, um, yeah, it's so powerful to have the next year's instructions written out. And then unless something goes completely haywire, um, which, by the way, if it goes haywire, uh, you meet at 90 day and you take it all out of the of the filing cabinet or you print it, you blow off any dust that accumulated in 90 days. And then you um, you evaluate if you're on target, if you're way off target or if it was a stupid target, yeah. you can make those 90 day corrections. And as I mentioned, during COVID, we've had to do that. Yeah. During a couple of recessions, we've had to do that. But I can tell you. 2023 is working out pretty much like we said it was. It's shaping up pretty much like I wrote it out last December. Yeah. Powerful. That's powerful right there. That is. I mean, it gives me chills. So yeah. it's powerful. So yeah. write it down. A business plan, writing it down. And of course, uh, read Michael Gerber's book and read my book. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Organizational muscle. Uh, I feel like I've been here the first time and we'll, I'll definitely have the, uh, um, the link below for that. And uh, yeah, and I, I mean, definitely hear that influence of Michael Gerber, uh, Emit, um, Jocko. I hear, you know, extreme ownership. Uh, definitely hear profit first. I hear. Yeah. Uh, traction. Yeah. yeah. So hear, hear a lot of that. that well, I mean, one of the things I became during this time period in 1997 when I was having this seizure is I became a hyper learner. So, you know, I go through college and my first 10 years out of college, not much of a learner. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, my God, I'm 37. I better get going. 
I become a hyper learner and I'm like reading a book a week and I'm implementing it and man, am I having fun? Yeah. You know, that was fun is learning and doing and, and uh, you know, basically what you're talking about, build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn. That's fun. And I think that's what entrepreneurs live for, yeah. you know? And so that's why you and me have kismet. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so you've shared, you shared here and, and I know in your book, you're, you're, you're in the process of executing your succession plan, which I think yes. is really powerful. Um, kind of planning your, your exit, so to speak. What's what, next? What's, what's on the agenda as you, well, you know, I'm looking to sell this book. Um, I'm going to make it my mission to sell a hundred thousand copies of the book. Um, I didn't say a million copies. That would have been a crazy idea, but I've actually written down sell a hundred thousand. And um, that's a hard idea, but not a crazy idea. Um, if I could just get Sherman Williams to buy 50,000 and give them to all the painters, I would, uh, I'd be <laughs> happy there. Um, there my book is more than that. It's really for any business owner. Yeah. Um, it's really never been about painting for me. It was about business. Um, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm basically gonna looking to be doing some speaking about it and traveling the country, doing some speaking to trade organizations and, and other business groups. Um, and then, you know, um, you know I, I talk a lot about it in my book about just finding other ways to control the hyper energy of an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I tell the sto a lot of stories about me being a runner. Um, so I'm 64 now. Um, I did, I ran two 5K races over the weekend. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sore and beat up from it. Um, uh, at some point, I won't be able to run as much as I do now. Not yet, but at some point. I mean, let's face it, sooner or later. Um, so I'm looking at for hobbies and things that I can do. Um, so my latest, uh, my latest thought, my wife is tired of hearing about it, but I've started, is I'm taking art classes. And um, I, want to, uh, I want to do plain air. So plain air is when you paint outside. So I have this whole vision of um, having a backpack filled with everything you would need to paint a landscape. So still painting, still part of my world. I'm a painter. Yeah. Um, but I, I have a vision of, um, you know, in my 70s, hiking to the top of a mountain, um, setting up camp, camping out, waking up the next morning, painting sunrise, packing it all up and hiking down. Nice. It would fulfill my spiritual my, my mental and my physical needs. Um, and so now I'm starting on that journey. Uh, I took my first art lessons about four weeks ago. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with it. I, I enjoy it. So there, that's all it counts. That's great. Well, so now that maybe, it, maybe it can be an open painting for all 50 states along with your marathon. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Don't give me any crazy ideas. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So uh, well, I always love to ask, uh, and if you have one, do you have a favorite founder film? That's, uh, well, you know, yeah, you sent the list and it, and it, it does turn out I, I read most of them. I saw most of them. Um, and um, so I'll pick the founder uh, with Michael Keaton. I've seen it three times. Um, when I first saw it, I was so excited that it was the first time I went to see a movie since Jurassic Park or something. And I, I remember like talking my brother into going with me and then going to McDonald's afterwards and having my first like Big Mac in like 20 years. <laughs> so, uh, so it was really cool. And the whole concept of him struggling. So I think that's a universal struggle, 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 succeed. Yeah. And he certainly struggled before he, he was successful. And um, that makes for a great story. So I'll pick that one. But I like them all. Um, I, I enjoyed them all. But the founder with Michael Keaton, the McDonald's story is a great story. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, where can we get your book and what are ways people could get in contact with you if you were wanting to? Yeah, so um, you can visit my website, organizationalmuscle.com uh, um, or short, orgmuscle.com. Um, so O-R-G-M-U-S-C-L-E.com. Um, and there, from there, you'll, you can, there's a link to Amazon. The book is available on Amazon. Yeah. Um, and very shortly will be available on audible, uh, read by me. Excellent. Uh, 
So um, twenty three hours in a phone booth or something. Like that. Yeah, yeah, it was not an easy, not an easy read uh, for me. Um, mostly because, like most entrepreneurs, sitting still for that long is um, yeah, not our cup of tea. Um, but you know, I pulled it off, and um, people like to hear a founder's story. So uh, that's what you got. So I often, by the way, say that um, just to sort of wrap up the uh, other concept, the why I wrote the book. Um, it had this original idea that, all right, here are the instructions. I'm leaving now. Yeah. So I'm leaving. Um, here's the founder's transcript of the business. Um, and like the Constitution of the United States, here's what I was thinking. Um, that's what the founding fathers were thinking. Now, we can change that. They can change that. As a matter of fact, they're going to have to change things because we, we've already talked about how much change in the world. Um, but they'll always know what the founder was thinking. And what the founder valued and the school of hard knocks it took to get there. I think that's a valuable story to share with your, with your children and your successors. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's been, a, it's been a fun journey and I've learned a lot about myself and hopefully I've, I've left a little bit of a legacy. Yeah, absolutely. And quite a legacy for sure. That's awesome. Well, that's Kevin, thanks for having yeah. Thanks so much for being here. This was this was awesome. Really, really love hearing your story. I know we could talk for hours, but thank you. Great. Well, as I always say, though, keep going. Keep going.